There's this tabletop RPG launching on Kickstarter called Demon Ascendance that I'll be honest with you, at first blush, I thought it was just a D&D 5e clone that didn't go that far afield from the 5e rules. But when I took a closer look and had the author Ludwig Emtas explain his design choices to me, I realized that this game is a perfect blueprint on how to take 5e and make it more focused, more streamlined, and just more fun to play, all without just replacing everything in the rules. In this video, I'm going to cover the 38 page quick start guide and go through just how this game's setting and mechanics challenge 5e in a way that I find extremely compelling. I'll leave a link down below if you'd like to check out the Kickstarter, which at the time of this recording just launched. So let's start with the setting. The game puts you in the role of a demon born, a person who outwardly, at least at the start of your adventures, appears completely human, but who possesses one flavor of demonic powers or another. The setting is medieval high fantasy, where there is a human world and a hellish realm that you could venture into. As far as the human population, your kind represents about 5% of it, which is actually a lot. I wanna pause there actually and discuss that a bit in a little sidebar here. So honestly, out of all the numbers in the entire quick start, this one fascinated me the most. 5% of a population having magical powers is a lot. Take for example, medieval England in the 1300s, which is actually appropriate since so much of modern fantasy like this game has its roots in that general time and place in the world. In 14th century England, there were three pillars in society, the nobility, the peasantry, and the clergy. Nobles owned the land and did the fighting for the most part. The peasantry worked the land and occasionally fought, and the clergy spent all their time praying and running church errands, which you think would be activities not terribly valued by society, but if you added up all the members of the clergy across the entire kingdom, the clergy made up almost 30,000 people, or 2% of the population at the time, and they happened to have a massive influence on all aspects of society through both the nobility and the peasantry. Well, taking that into consideration, the demon born in the setting of demon ascendants makes up 5% of the population of the kingdom. And unlike vanilla clergy members of medieval England, these folks have actual magical powers that can hurt people and bend wills. If you think about the implications of that, it means that they would, without a doubt, act as the ruling class over the population. And indeed, the author accounts for this, stating that they, quote, often take positions of importance and power within the society. Driving the point even further is the fact that a demon born lives at least 200 years and maybe a lot longer depending on their powers. I think what I like about this whole notion is that you are given a setting that has very concrete notions of social order, unlike what you get with a kitchen sink fantasy setting like Forgotten Realms, where the details of society are foggy at best. As for the actual game's rules, they do borrow a lot from 5e. The author says the idea is to meet 5e players halfway when teasing them out of their shells. It's a rollover d20 system, natural 1s are always a failure, natural 20s are always a success, and advantage and disadvantage are in play where you sometimes roll 2d20s and take either the better or the worse result respectively but here's the first place in the mechanics where you see some brilliant deviation, edge dice. Instead of rewarding good positioning and tactical approaches with flat bonuses like advantage or plus two or plus four or whatever, Demon Ascendance gives players an easy to track stackable reward in the form of edge dice, where players can add a d4 to their d20 roll, or if there are two edges on a roll, a d6, or three edges, a d8. With this edge system, there are no flat bonus numbers to remember. It's just a universal, stackable, step die system that's just dead simple. The core stats are pretty standard with seven instead of the array of six that you normally see in D&D type games, but instead of having a stat score from which a secondary modifier is derived, your stat is your modifier, which is always something I love to see. Skills are associated with most of these stats and you can have proficiency in one when you start a character. If you're rolling on a skill, you just use the associated core stat as the modifier to your d20 roll. If you happen to be proficient in that skill, you roll two d20s and take the higher roll, then add your modifier. Another deviation from 5e is how defense works in this game. Instead of having a list of saving throw values, your six defense types are actually the average of two core stats, as you can see pretty cleverly illustrated here on the character sheet. All right, so what about the actual player options? In the quick start, there are four so-called bloodlines detailed. These define the type of demonic power that your character is born with, and the full game will have at least three more. 
I think the word demonic might be slightly misleading in this context because the different bloodlines don't all really seem thematically connected to traditional notions of demonic or hellish domains. So you have to expand your notion of what demonic means here. The infernal is obviously going to be the smallest stretch of the imagination. A character with this bloodline has the power of fire and destruction, including brief periods of self-immolation as part of their powers. Each bloodline gets a few starting powers right out of the gate, and for the infernal, it's the ability to manipulate small flames, increase fire damage, and a coil that deals fire damage. Higher level abilities are cordoned off by three characteristics, agile, strong, and gifted. For example, if your character doesn't have the agile characteristic, then they can't access these three abilities. If you take a look at the abilities themselves, they do tend to mostly be martially related, which is to say, you can just tell from this list that Demon Ascendance is really largely about combat, at least from what the quick start is presenting. The Dreadful is the next bloodline that you can choose, and once again, this one doesn't really go that far afield from traditional notions of demonic powers. Your dreadful character has the power of shadows, darkness, and terror, and can create illusions and terrifying visions inside of a target's mind. Their default abilities include help with hiding, full night vision, and another kind of attack coil, one that deals shadow damage. I think one thing that jumped out at me here was how these abilities had a very different fighting style from the previous set of abilities for the Infernal. And this was intentional. The idea was to make each of these bloodlines distinct in terms of playstyle so that players could have completely different experiences even though they're all playing as demon-born humans. In the case of the Dreadful, your play is very heavily centered around themes of shadows and darkness and dark creepy stuff like tattoos or tentacles lashing out at enemies. Let's take a look at the next bloodline, the Magnetic. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with the expanded definition of demonic powers. These folks manipulate magnetic fields and gravity itself, so they're able to throw things around or even walk on walls and ceilings. This doesn't seem inherently demonic in nature, but I think it was critical that the author get a bit more liberal with the definition in order to flesh out a full game. I don't know whether or not he'll stick the landing with the lore that will be found in the full game, but certainly the motivation to have wildly different ability sets is understood. If you're playing as a magnetic, all of your powers are centered around magnetism and a sort of gravitational telekinesis. The final bloodline in the quick start is the spectral, which gives your character the ability to bend reality through spiritual and spectral power. Like the dreadful, you also have some abilities that allow you to read and influence minds directly. The powers are mostly about spectral-based abilities like invisibility, projection, evasion, and various attacks. Bloodlines are really only half of your PC's build, the other half being their class. The Quick Start details three sample classes, and these are all going to be pretty familiar to 5e players, a Berserker, a Ranger, and a Druid. There is a bit of a surprise with the third one that we'll get to in a minute. As for the Berserker, your abilities are all about brute strength attacks. In the case of the level two specialization Frenzy, you can buy an extra action after killing an enemy by taking out a chunk of damage yourself. The Ranger's abilities emphasize attacks from afar, but there is a subtle and clever innovation here. Ranged attacks can be used as a reaction to fire at moving enemies within range, which means players who have ranged characters will not just check out when it's not their turn. Since a reaction can happen at any time in a round, that player will hopefully continue paying attention in order to possibly snag a reaction ranged attack. And rangers at level three have the improved quick fire feature, which essentially allows them two such reaction attacks. The final class in the quick starter is the druid, and this one is a doozy. Instead of two pages detailing their abilities, it's six. And that's largely due to the huge number of shape-shifting options that you can choose from. Just as a caveat, a druid character does not turn entirely into any given creature, but rather parts of their body morphs into exaggerated forms borrowed from the physiology of those creatures. So for example, if you choose armadillo in combat, you get huge claws that resemble an armadillo's and armored skin. There are also a couple of class specializations under the druid class, the wave dancer, which emphasizes aquatic themed abilities, and feral, which are reminiscent of the berserkers melee combat buffs. So here's another interesting innovation in the rules. Essentially, unless you're using powers that have volatile effects like fire or lightning, damage in this game is static, 
which means you aren't fiddling with rolling for damage if you land a hit. Instead, each weapon and most attacks have a predefined amount of damage that they deal. You still have to take into consideration damage type in case the enemy has resistance or immunity, but otherwise the damage is based on one of your core stats or another. I think it's important to note that in this game, your character gets two main actions and one sub action per turn. This seems like a lot of actions, but according to the author in his many playtests, the average combat does not end up being any longer than in 5e since it takes fewer rounds to resolve. And like with Pathfinder 2e, more actions per turn means players have more freedom to strategize. The demonic surge mechanic is one that really unifies the theme of the game with the setting itself and your character. What happens is that you can opt to push your body by tapping into your demonic power, and that grants an automatic success in an attack or defense under certain circumstances. But the cost of that is that you then have to roll a d20 against a target of 17 with your demonic influence score as a modifier. If you roll at or above 17, then you will pick up two random mutations, one negative and one positive. This is where the demon stuff really kicks in for your character. Once you start picking up negative mutations like these, you will really start to take on the look and feel of a traditionally construed demon, and your social roles with NPCs will start to suffer at the DM's discretion. A couple of things that I wanted to point out here. One, the ancient languages that you can learn here include a couple of hints at the setting's lore. Aside from some special names for each of the bloodlines and these terms, you don't get much of a taste of the setting proper in the quick start, and it's something I'm really pretty curious about. The other thing here is talents, which can really take your character to the next level in a fight, and that got me wondering how challenging the enemies will be in this game. It remains to be seen. Combat is very firmly defined as taking place on a grid where each square is a fairly standard two meters by two meters. I thought one fun mechanic was the death ladder, where when your character hits zero health, they start a sort of countdown where they have to roll each turn. With each failed roll, they move down one step on the ladder, and upon the fourth failed roll, they are dead. There's actually another ladder in the game called the Fatigue Ladder, where the fourth level of fatigue is an instant death. This is a bit of an underdescribed mechanic in the quick start that really fascinates me because it harkens to the more harsh and unforgiving approach of OSR games. I'll be curious to see all the details of fatigue in the full game. All right, here are my thoughts on the Demon Ascendant quick start. Setting lore is key. I currently have a hard time saying whether or not I'd like this game because I don't know, at least from reading the quick start, what the specifics of the world are. Setting details mean a lot to me since they are the foundation of a unique and compelling collective story. And there are wisps and hints of an intensely interesting world in this game, but I just can't say if the full game will deliver. Combat is the point. This is more of a personal thing, but I also really love games that encourage characters to do things other than fight. But to be fair, I think the point of this game is to offer a fresh alternate take on 5e, which itself is a combat-centric game. Interesting new mechanics. I think this is exactly the kind of game that could lure some 5e players out of their comfort zone because even though most of the rules are familiar, there is this handful of interesting alternate rules for things that actually have a huge positive impact on play. The static damage is a big one where for the most part, you're not having to roll for damage on every attack. The core stats being the modifiers themselves is pretty convenient. And edge dice, which step up from D4 to D6 to D8, depending on how many situational advantages you've stacked on a single roll is pretty great. It's all just very intuitive and fun. Dynamic play styles. It eventually clicked with me after reading through this quick start that the setting and how characters interact with it is kind of like Avatar The Last Airbender where there is a tension between the mundanes and the benders. And for the most part, it is the benders who rule over all, mostly in tyranny, or at least cycles of tyranny. As a demon born, you're either a shadow bender, if you please, or a gravity bender, or a fire bender, etc. And your bloodline defines your existence, and your existence is a very special one in the world. This is just like in Avatar, where benders are special individuals. The only twist here is that your powers all stem from some sort of hellish, and I presume inherently evil, origin. So in conclusion, I think this is just the kind of game you can use as a crowbar to pry 5e players away from their precious game. 
This game has a much more focused setting and easier mechanics and has been extensively playtested. The final game will include the additional bloodlines of Fervor, whose members can manipulate the essence of mortality, Storm, who can wield wrath and lightning, and the Frozen, which control frost, crystals, and ice. If there's enough funding, you might also see Icker, which wields blood and pain, and Lunar, whose powers center around the moon and sun. Additional classes will include Warrior, Guardian, Monk, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, and maybe a few more. I've left a link below to where you can check this out. Let me know in the comments if you plan on backing this one. And I'd also like to know if you found any success in converting 5e players to other RPGs. If you have, let me know how you did it. And as always, thanks for watching. See ya.